Hello, my name is Dr Ian Stewart and I'm a historian of modern Europe at UCL. In this short talk, I'm going to introduce you to one of the topics that I cover on my thematic seminar module on the Cultural Cold War in Europe from 1917 to 1989. The topic I'm going to be discussing is the role of jazz music in the politics of the Cold War. And I'm going to look at this from three angles. First, I want to talk about the significance of jazz in the cultural politics of the European communist world. Then I'll say a few words about how jazz music was used in American Cold War cultural diplomacy. And then finally, I want to say a few things about questions that the case of jazz music raises for the history of the cultural Cold War more broadly. Now, the history of jazz music in the Soviet Union and the countries of communist Eastern Europe predates the start of the Cold War. Jazz was popular among many music lovers throughout the history of the Soviet Union, for instance. However, the regime's attitude to this music changed in response to different political circumstances. In the 1930s, which is a time when the state banned experimental and improvisational tendencies across wide swathes of cultural life, jazz music was actually tolerated and indeed even encouraged Although jazz music's improvisational tendencies were in tension with a cultural policy directed towards standardisation and control, it was endorsed by the regime in the 1930s because the music could be celebrated as the culture of a minority group, African Americans, who were oppressed by American capitalism. The high point of the state's endorsement of jazz music came in 1938 with the establishment of the state's jazz orchestra which was personally auditioned by Joseph Stalin himself. At the start of the Cold War, however, jazz music was criminalised in the Soviet Union, with Stalin going so far as to ban the saxophone altogether in 1949. This was because the Soviet leadership understood the Cold War as having divided the world into two camps, differentiated not just by their political and economic systems, but also by their cultures. In this context, jazz music came to be associated with the decadent bourgeois culture of American capitalism and its influence inside the communist world was understood as risking a kind of pernicious cultural contagion. And now that communist regimes since the end of the Second World War have been installed across Central and Eastern Europe, the new Soviet cultural line was applied in those countries as well. For example, in this period, a famous Polish propaganda slogan remarked that, quote, today he plays jazz, tomorrow he betrays the motherland. But the banning of jazz during the early Cold War didn't eradicate the music. In fact, it just sent it underground. And the lengths to which jazz listeners would go to acquire recordings of the music they loved were remarkable. Most notably in the Soviet Union, bootleggers began to sell cheap copies of jazz records that had been made by copying the music onto used X-ray films, which could be played on home turntables. So the image that you can see to the right of the screen here is a photograph of um, a few of these X-ray records um, onto which jazz music was secretly recorded in the late 40s and the 1950s. By the middle of the 1950s, however, it became much easier for listeners behind the Iron Curtain to hear jazz music because that's when the United States began broadcasting jazz into communist countries on long range radio channels such as Voice of America and Radio Free Europe. And this brings me to the second part of my talk, which focuses on the role of jazz music in American Cold War cultural diplomacy. How and why was jazz mobilised by the American government during the Cold War? Well, I've just mentioned how American long-range radio broadcast jazz music beyond the Iron Curtain from the 1950s onwards. And the reach of these programmes was astonishing. For example, it's estimated that the Willis Connor the Jazz Hour show on Voice of America had 30 million listeners in communist countries uh, across Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. A second form that American jazz diplomacy took during the Cold War was the organisation of tours by jazz bands. 
The first of these happened in 1956, when Dizzy Gillespie and his band performed across Africa and the Middle East in a tour that was organised by the American State Department. Then in 1958, Dave Brubeck was the first jazz musician to perform Behind the Iron Curtain when he took his band to Poland in another tour organised by the State Department. And the first American jazz tour inside the Soviet Union took place in 1962, when Benny Goodman's band performed in Moscow. On the screen there on the left, you can see a picture of the famous jazz musician Duke Ellington during his um, uh, tour to the Soviet Union in 1972. This, this, this picture's from a reception held in Moscow to celebrate uh, his visit. Now, the fact that all of these jazz tours uh, are taking place inside even the Soviet Union um, is surprising given what I was saying earlier about the criminalisation of jazz music uh, at the start of the Cold War. So why was it that this, um, that this was allowed to happen? Well, it became possible as a result of a change in cultural policy uh, which took place following the death of Joseph Stalin in March 1953. So in February 1956, Stalin's successor, Nikita Khrushchev, gave a famous speech in which he denounced Stalinism and opened the way for a period of relative cultural liberalisation that came to be known as the Thor. By allowing jazz music to be performed publicly again, communist regimes signalled to their populations that things really had changed for the better in this new post-Stalinist era. Jazz music was legalised and even promoted then, with the aim of legitimating this new, more culturally tolerant form of communism. But what did the American government want to achieve by organising jazz tours and radio broadcasts? Well, firstly, jazz music was embraced by the State Department because it could be used to challenge one of the main negative stereotypes about the United States in European public opinion. And this was the view that America was a sort of cultural wasteland that didn't really have anything to offer the world culturally beyond cheeseburgers and Mickey Mouse. Jazz music could be presented, however, as evidence that the United States had its own musical tradition that deserved to be taken seriously as a form of high culture, but which also had broad popular appeal as well. Secondly, because of its experimental and improvisational qualities, jazz music could be presented as the musical embodiment of American freedom, while also drawing attention to the absence of such freedom in those countries where jazz music was banned. Finally, the State Department's embrace of jazz was a way of presenting a more positive view of American race relations at a time when violent and discriminatory forms of racism fueled anti-American sentiment all over the world. Now, in this respect, it's particularly significant that jazz tours organised by the State Department were conducted by mixed race bands, typically under the leadership of prominent African-American musicians like Dizzy Gillespie or Duke Ellington. Now I'd like to conclude this talk by mentioning some of the larger issues that the politics of jazz music in the Cold War raises for historians of the cultural Cold War. And I want to talk through what this means, in, particularly in terms of different approaches that historians might take to this topic. And one way to approach the history of the cultural Cold War is to think of it as a history of state cultural policies, whether on the Soviet communist side or on the side of the United States. This would be to take a kind of top-down approach focused on political elites um, and how and why governments' cultural policies changed over time by looking comparatively at Soviet and American governments changing attitudes to things like jazz music or abstract painting or the politics of literature, just to take a few examples. Now, this kind of um, top-down approach is undoubtedly really interesting, but an exclusive focus on state policy does also carry certain risks. One of these risks is that we uh, have there's a danger of overlooking the agency of individual artists and performers who did not necessarily attribute the same significance to their work as the states that used that work in cultural diplomacy did. So when it comes to the jazz tours I was mentioning earlier, for example, 
we need to understand how the performers themselves understood what they were doing. When African-American performers were asked to comment on racism in contemporary America during overseas press conferences, for instance, how did they respond? When they acknowledged and criticised this racism, did they, in so doing, undermine the State Department's project of promoting a positive image of the United States? This is a difficult question to answer, and historians disagree on it. A second risk of focusing exclusively on state cultural policies is that we overlook the agency of audiences, the audiences who consumed the culture which was mobilised or banned during the Cold War. So, for example, although the American government presented jazz music as embodying the value of political liberty, it's not at all, cl it's not at all clear that audiences actually understood it in this way. In fact, the evidence here is quite mixed. So some historians would argue that listening to jazz under communism was a profoundly political act. But others would note that the most ardent Soviet jazz fans in the early Cold War were actually social dropouts who turned their backs on politics altogether. What's more, in this respect, the youth subcultures that emerged around jazz music in the Soviet Union and elsewhere in the communist world actually resemble the equivalent youth subcultures which developed around the same time in the West. Here's an example. So on the left of your screen you can see what's known as a Zazu, um, and that's the name of a French youth subculture which developed in the 1940s around jazz fandom. On the right of your screen you can see a photograph of a Stiliadji, which means style seeker uh, in Russian. And um, this, this term, Stiliadji, denotes an equivalent youth subculture in the Soviet Union from around the same time, the late 1940s and the 1950s. So we can see similar youth subcultures developing around the same time around jazz music on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Then. And not only are we seeing the same sorts of youth subcultures, but we're also seeing very similar public responses to those subcultures on both sides of the Iron Curtains, because the phenomenon of zoot-suited, jazz-loving, delinquent youths provoked similar moral panics in societies on the East and on the West in the 1940s and in the 1950s. And this is really, really important to recognise for two reasons. Firstly, it shows that for all we might be shocked by communist regimes criminalisation of jazz, we shouldn't necessarily assume that such policies were simply imposed on helpless communist societies which rejected the policies. In fact, anti-jazz sentiment was actually quite widespread in these societies as well. It wasn't just the concern of the political elite. The second thing to, con to, to consider is that parallel youth subcultures and the moral panics uh, that they provoked on both sides of the Iron Curtain during the early Cold War show that the socio-cultural history of the Cold War doesn't actually always divide along the same clear lines as the political history of the Cold War does. Now that brings me um, to the end of this short talk on jazz music and the cultural Cold War. I hope you found it um, interesting. Um, thank you very much for listening.